Good afternoon, everyone. How's the conference going so, so far? Great. Great. So today I'm going to talk about how you all can become data superheroes for nonprofits in our area. Imagine that you are a nonprofit leader. You are working day and night to help people. In my case, my organization, we help people learn how to use technology. You've been collecting data for years and years. You have to collect data. You have to report to your funders and in your annual report who you're serving and how you're serving them. But you know that there's so much more that you can do. You know that there are stories that your data tells that you just can't quite figure out. What do you do? That's exactly the position that Bite Back was in of about a year ago when we looked at our large set of data that we've been collecting for years and years. And so today I'm going to talk about how we were able to overcome that problem and how you all can help other organizations to do the same. Back is a nonprofit. We are based in DC and we work primarily with DC residents. And our mission is to improve economic opportunity by providing computer training and career services to underserved residents of our region. And so what that means is that we provide classes to people, to adults, and teach them how to use technology. We meet people where they are, which means that we have hundreds of people every year who come through our doors who don't know how to use a mouse, who don't know how to navigate a home screen. We also, we then help the, those individuals move up our training pathway. So some of our students start at that beginner level, others might come in at our intermediate level or into our advanced industry recognized certification classes. In addition to providing that training, which is one of the, the core service we provide, we also help people to find jobs. Jobs in IT and jobs that use technology are some of the few careers out there where people can get training over six months or a year and move into a living wage job. You don't necessarily need a college degree to find a job that helps you to support your families. And so that's really um, you know, the second part, that, second part of our work. We help people use the tech skills, get certifications that employers are looking for, and then we link them with jobs. And then the third part of our work is referrals. We work with students, and I'll talk about this a little later, who face significant challenges around housing, around food, around even being able to afford transportation. And so we refer our students to other services, other social services, because that's not um, one of the services we provide. So that's, at a high level, what Bite Back does. Biteback was founded in 1997, and I think it's amazing that our co-founders in 1997 saw the importance of technology, that technology provides a pathway to, to working class people, to low income people, into the middle class and into living wage careers. So they, they, thought they, they came up with this term, fight back, and they, they then it, fight back inspired bite back. Uh, Biteback started, we were a tiny, tiny neighborhood organization based out of a row house in Northeast DC where we still actually are headquartered. Um, and we were just working with a few people. Over the past seven or eight years, we've grown exponentially. And now, since 2009, over 7,000 students have come through our door. So over 7,000 adults, primarily who live in DC, have come to us with, with help to get help around technology. Um, and our students, and again, I'll talk about this a little more, are so inspiring because many of them don't have stable homes, are struggling to pay the rent, and yet they come to Bite Back to make their lives better, and I think it's so amazing. As, over the past 10 years, as technology has become more and more critical to our lives, we've seen bite back grow. And it's a little counterintuitive because we, use, we all use technology every second of the day. And um, 
Unfortunately, even though technology has become more important in our lives, the digital divide has not necessarily been shrinking, at least among the people who Bite Back works with. So we see increased numbers of people coming through our doors desperate to get technology skills. In um, last year, in 2015 to 2016, we had 854 course enrollments. We taught 93 classes. We had students from across DC, but as you can see, Northeast and Southeast DC, which are primarily the most low income wards of the city, that's where most of our students come from. 75% of our students use the skills that they learn at Bite Back to search for new jobs. I'll never forget, I was going shopping in Columbia Heights and I passed the new Chick-fil-A, it wasn't yet opened. And it said, we're hiring, apply online. So even for those jobs that we consider to be relatively low skilled, you have to be able to not only access a computer with internet, you have to be able to navigate a web form. And a lot of our students come through our doors not able to do that. One of my favorite things about the work that we do at Bite Back is that I think we are really challenging the idea of what the tech world looks like. And I know that there was a lunch on diversity that many of you just came from. And I, I think that's so critical because there are, there's so much untapped potential in this country of people and talent to contribute to the tech world. And so again, our students are coming to us not really fitting the mold of what we think of when we think of tech workers. 67% of our students last year received government benefits. Almost 30% were homeless or they didn't have secure housing. So they were living in a car, they were living with a friend or a family member who could kick them out at any time. We had a student last year who was coming to our certification classes. He was in our advanced classes and he was living in a storage unit. That's what our students, that's what our students are struggling with and they're still coming to bite back and doing really well and moving into tech jobs. I think it's amazing. 74% of our students last year were unemployed. We see a wide range of students last year from the age of 17 to 88 years old. Uh, Almost all of our students are people of color, most black or African American or Latino. And uh, something I'm very proud of is that almost 50% of our students last year were women, which is compared to about 25% of, uh, of the percentage of women working in tech. So I think that's really awesome. So what do our students learn when they come to Bite Back? They are getting skills that are both really transforming how they interact with the world and are able to participate in the world, as well as getting skills that are helping them to move into, move into jobs. For our PC for Beginners class, which is our very, very basic class, our students come in, they, in order to, be, to determine if our students go into intermediate or beginner, we give a very simple assessment. That assessment is they have to create a Word document that has their name on it. Save it to save it to their des a desktop or wherever. Save it on the computer and then email it to one of our staff. Many many people of our students cannot pass that, and so then they're placed into the PC for Beginners class. So, the beginner of a PC, PC for Beginners class, our students don't know how to send an email, and by the end of the class, it's a six week class, our students can send a job resume as an email attachment, which is amazing. Now they're able to actually apply for a job. Our intermediate level class, which we call Office Track, is really focused on getting our students more comfortable with the Microsoft Office suite. In that class, they come in, they've never seen Microsoft Excel, and they leave the class where they can create graphs, charts, presentations using Excel and PowerPoint. And then we have our, our advanced, what we call advanced certification classes. So they, in those classes, our students go from having a rudimentary knowledge of Excel to being able to uh, use formulas for tasks and to troubleshoot building formulas. And for our A-plus certification class, which is a certification for people who are interested in going into jobs as an IT help desk specialist, for example, they come in not really having an understanding of hardware and finish being able to build a computer from scratch and really being able to troubleshoot. So these skills are um, really, again, transformative from what they, they came in with before. 
And what I'm most proud of, I think having new skills is amazing, but what I'm most proud of is the amazing outcomes that we see. My favorite statistic is that for our students who come in and don't have a job, and this is specifically our advanced certification students, and then are hired into a job. So last year we had 53 graduates who were hired into living wage jobs. Their incomes went up for yearly $28,000. So from that very first year, they are making $28,000 more than they were before. And so when you think about what are the things, thank you. I mean, just think about how that can totally change someone's life. 96% of our students said that they were more skilled than, than before. I don't know who those 4% were, but um, who didn't? And all of our students, every student I've ever talked to, and, and the vast majority of them, express an increase in their overall self-confidence. As you think about going from living in a world where you see everyone using their phones to call in Uber, using email to communicate to their coworkers, being at work and not being able to use a computer when your coworkers can, it really changes people's uh, sense of self and the, the sense, of, sense of potential that they have. So that's Bite Back and that's some of our data. And I think about when I, I joined Bite Back a year ago, and, and I think a year ago, Biteback was very similar to a lot of nonprofits in the way that we use data. So there was a 2016 survey of nonprofit staff. It was called the, St the State of Data in the Nonprofit Sector. And what they found is 90% of the survey respondents said that they were collecting, da collecting data. You can't get funding unless you report on basic outcomes. A lot of foundations, for example, will ask how many students did you serve? Stuff like that. Everybody's doing that. What I find really interesting is only 49% of the survey respondents knew how their organization was collecting data. So people know that they're collecting it, but they don't really know how that's happening, what are the systems that are being utilized. And then only 5% of the respondents said that they use data in every decision they make. So I think this is very typical. We are collecting the data, we're not really sure how it's working, we're not really understanding how to use it, and then we're probably not using it very much because of that. So why aren't more nonprofits using data? 97% of the, the survey respondents said they're interested in using it more, which I think is great. We're starting from a position where we really understand how important data is. But why aren't we using it? So when I came to Bite Back a year ago, we were using a database that I had never heard of called Orbund. And then, but because we didn't really know how to use it, we were also collecting data in Excel. It was a mess. So we have data in Excel over here, then we have some data in Orbund in order to ever pull in, like we would pull the data out of Orbund, but then we would have students that were being tracked in two different systems. We didn't, know, we didn't have the tools. And then I think the other really significant barrier is that a lot of nonprofit staff just don't have a lot of experience using data. Nonprofit leaders come from all different backgrounds. There are people who are lawyers, there are people who didn't go to college, there are people who are social workers. I have a master's in public affairs. And so we just, it's not a requirement that we have experience using data. And I think a lot of people are kind of nervous about it. I came from a nonprofit where we did use data. I'm also married to a statistician and economist, so I'm not scared of it, but that's not, that's not typical. Um, and then the other really signif significant issue is that we just don't have enough time or money to pay for it. It was a big sacrifice for Bite Back to hire a data and evaluation manager, and I'm so glad we did. And he came to this conference yesterday, and he loved it. But it's a decision. We, have, we all have limited resources. And so for most nonprofits, if you're deciding between hiring a data person and hiring someone who's going to provide direct services to your participants, it's, it's pretty hard to make a decision not to hire that person who's going to be directly working with your participants. So these are, these are the reasons. I mean, these are, real, these are real reasons. It's not because nonprofits aren't interested or understand the value. 
So what can we do? We had an amazing experience getting a, a team of data scientists and engineers to help us to understand our data. And that's what I want to spend the rest of my time here talking to you about. We were very lucky that we found out about a program through a data company called APT, which is a MasterCard company. We heard that they were accepting applications from nonprofits to do a 24-hour data dive. And we said, this sounds amazing, let's do it. And we applied and we were selected. And so this spring, we had the opportunity to have a team of 60 people at this company combing through our data from over from the previous five years. And it has been completely transformative for us in how we're doing our work. So I want to talk a little about that. So that is our, you know, this was our superhero move that helped us move from that. We're collecting the data to really understanding and using it. So how does a data dive work? For in this example, we had this amazing team at APT who had access to our data. We spent um, many months collecting it and combing through it and sending it over to them. So they had our data and they took 24 hours to answer a set of questions about Byteback and about our impact. The team was very collaborative and cross-functional. So there were data scientists working with marketing people, working with mapping experts, all together looking at these questions. Um, there were no required or expected tools that they were bringing. They used their tools that they had available to them as in, in the company. And they used data, analytics, and technical skills. And they had a singular focus of looking at the questions that we had come up with and saying, how can we help bite back, understand the answers to these questions so that we could make more, that, so that we can make more impact for our students. So the setting up for the data dive was pretty time intensive. About two months before the dive started, we decided on three key questions that could be answered. We actually ended up answering four. We talked about what were the data we had available to us that could answer those questions, and then we sent them data from four years. There were 3,300 student records, and APT used about a third of those. We, they linked our, some of the data we had ex, in Excel with the data that we now have in Salesforce. I'm very proud to say we actually use Salesforce. It is our database, and we're, we're not having like 10 different databases now. So they linked those two things, and they identified gaps. We had a lot of back and forth to make sure that our data was usable. So about two weeks before the data dive, the APT, the APT team worked and loaded all of our data into their platforms. They created a high-level plan. How are they going to approach this? And then they had three teams of 20 people who spent 24 hours really doing a deep predictive analysis of the four questions we came up with. And so in those 24 hours, they dug deep into the questions and then presented us the results the next day. They used, um, they have a lot of proprietary um, software. I asked if they use Python, they did. But they used their test and learn software, they did statistical regressions, um, they made some models from Excel, and they have a third party software for mapping. The four questions that we looked at were, which types of biteback students are most likely to drop out of our classes? Which types of students are most likely to pass or re-enroll into future classes? So those are our classroom success. We wanted to see what are the characteristics of the students who are struggling so we can figure out ways to help them more, and what are the characteristics of the students who are doing really well. We also looked at employment success. Which applicants are most likely to succeed? So which bite back graduates or participants are most likely to move into jobs? And then the fourth question was, where should we locate our classes? We teach all throughout DC in every ward. So it was very, it's very interesting for us to understand where we should be finding places to teach. The data dive used a wealth of data. And I'm very proud that we had, this was the, they do this a few times a year. And our data set was the richest data set they had. So they were able to really dig in. And that's why the team was so large. They looked at what are the characteristics of our instructors, 
what, how are students attending? Are they attending class? Which types of classes are students leaving? They looked at end of class surveys that we give. They looked at our completion rates. They looked at outcomes around employment, around how students were reporting using computers and looked at where we had taught and the success of those class locations. So they really looked at basically everything we could, we could throw at them, they looked at it. Okay. So what did they find? It was really interesting what they found. What they found. Some of it made sense and some of it was a little surprising to us. They found that and this makes sense when you think about it, but we never thought about it this way, that those students who have stable homes do better. So the students who come to us and have a job, and maybe it's part-time or maybe it's full-time, but who have a job do end up completing, completing better, like they complete at higher rates. And that's a little counterintuitive because you think about someone balancing and juggling a job and coming to bite back and being with their families and all the stuff that life throws at you, but yet those students who do have a job are doing better. Students who are older tend to complete their classes better or have a higher percentage rate of completing bite back classes, and students who live in their own home do better. So students who have that stability are really able to focus more at bite back. And so that tells us something about where we invest our resources. It tells us that we really need to be continuing to build partnerships to link our students with those types of services to help them have a stable life. Students, this is very interesting, inter interesting. students with postgraduate education, so who have a bachelor's degree and went beyond that, that actually don't do as well. We're not really sure why. We think that maybe we're not meeting their needs. Maybe they have a different type of need. Maybe our classes are not are, are too easy, so they're dropping out. Maybe they're going to find work. And then female students are actually doing better, controlling for other factors. For the classroom location analysis, they looked at two things. One, they looked at, they looked at 53 bite back locations across the city, and they said, in what locations are the students most likely to complete and pass the class and move on to jobs? And then they looked at what are the locations in DC that are underserved, where there aren't a lot of resources like Bite Back for students. And so the nexus between these two areas, we determined would be the optimal classroom location, because we, we know that the students will be coming, in the, coming to classes in those communities would, will be successful, and there's need there. And so APT mapped the, the entire city for us and showed us potential locations where, uh, where we believe our students will, will do really well. And that's great. We're using this all the time to figure out where to locate our next set of classes. So just to summarize, we now know, thanks to this data dive, that Stable housing is extremely important. That enrolling our students in the right difficulty level is extremely important. And that we know that older students, for example, are more likely to complete the class. So we need to think about how are we reaching out to younger students to make sure that they have the resources they need to finish. We know that students who are employed beforehand do better. So we can work with them definitely to move into jobs, but then what are the additional services we need to provide to unemployed students to make sure that they can also succeed? And we also know, thanks to this analysis, that classes in Northeast and Southeast DC and specific neighborhoods are going to be effective places for us to offer our classes. And we actually, Biteback is actually moving into new headquarters, and so this finding is also helping us to determine where we should house our operations. So I think this was, it was such an amazing experience. We really, um, there were assumptions that we were disproved for us and it really is the first time that we are able to make these types of decisions, not just based on anecdotes or kind of what we, what we intuit, but make it based on real data. And as we look forward, we have already started using this data in many ways. Like I said, we're using the mapping data. We now are able to look at students when they come in and 
determine which ones we think are a little more high risk and make sure that our instructors are spending extra time with those students. So now, APT was our superhero, but I want to give a charge to all of you to also become data superheroes. And there's so many ways that you can do that. One is to think about leading a similar data dive at your company or your organization. There are, DC has the highest per capita number of nonprofits in the country. There are so many organizations out there who could so benefit from having an experience like that, so like this. And please feel free to reach out to me and I'd be happy to also connect you all to folks at APT to talk a little bit more about this. So that's one way that you can, that you can become a superhero. Another way is to volunteer with a nonprofit. Like I said, Jackie is on our board. She's the reason I'm here. Um, she is amazing. And so there's so many ways to volunteer for nonprofits. At Biteback, for example, we're always looking for board members. We're looking for people to help teach our classes, to tutor, to come in and talk to our students about your careers. And there's just such a need. It can be so helpful to, um, for participants and constituents at nonprofits to meet people who are doing the amazing work that you're doing. Mentoring is another wonderful way to support uh, an organization like Bite Back or other nonprofits, our students really benefit from ha being able to talk to people who have careers and really understand how do you navigate a career, how do you succeed in an interview, how do you network. Things that we all often take for granted are not are not that obvious to people who've never had a chance to have a, a white collar job. So that's another way. And then of course, because I'm a nonprofit executive director, we all love money, so donate. So there's so many, <laughs> there's so many ways that you all can be superheroes. And I need to close um, this first asking for questions, but then second, asking my daughter, I mean, thanking my daughter Ella for letting me borrow her cape. And she loves superheroes, and that's her at Disneyland last week um, in the Jedi Training Academy. So I'm very proud of her. Um, so any questions, and thank you so much. You know, it's a great question. So I don't, but I can definitely um, reach out to the folks at APT and ask them, and I'm sure they would be happy to um, talk with anyone who's interested in that. So I can definitely do that. What were some of the assumptions that were by the data? Sure. So one of the assumptions we had was that folks who were on government benefits maybe that they would have a different um, outcomes than we would have assumed. Maybe they would be doing better, maybe they would be doing worse. And what we found is that actually didn't have a huge impact. So folks who were getting food stamps were doing about the same as everyone else. So that was really, that was really interesting. I think we had, a, we had an idea that it was hard for students who had a job to really juggle coming to bite back and working. And that was totally not true. Like it was, it was the opposite. The students who had a job, who have a job, actually do better. So those were some of them that were just very interesting for us to see. I had a question. Hi. What's the, sure. tech, the strategy going forward to evaluate the, these data questions again and, and keep on top of the, the data collection and, and so on and so forth? Absolutely. That's a great question. So um, like I said, we're so excited. We hired someone who is a data person and we now collect all of our data in Salesforce. So we... I mean, even this quarter, we just I just met with my senior management team. It was the first time in a year that we were able to have quarterly data, like ready. We were able to see how many students have already been placed in a job in this first quarter. So we have totally revamped how we're collecting data. And then we are in touch with APT on a regular basis and hope that you know, at the end of this year, we'll be able to send them over some data and see if we, can, if we see any differences in our outcomes or um, in the characteristics of students who are succeeding. So I'm going to go ahead and cut this off. Sure. Um, but Elizabeth will be here afterwards. Yes. And I have uh, one announcement to make. Sure. Elizabeth does not know about this, um, but last weekend, uh, Capital One hosted a hackathon, Banking with Humanity, and one of the prizes we gave out 
was to allow the winning teams to each give $10,000 to one of our nonprofit partners. And two of the winning teams selected Bite Back. Oh so God. Bite Back will be giving $20,000. <laughs> Thank you. That's so amazing. Oh my God. That is so amazing. No problem. Thank you session. all. We have a break now. Next session starts at 2.15. And there's my, my email address. is not on there. It is elindsay at You find it on our website. And I have cards. Thank you so much. No this was so fun.